My name is Darren Collins, and notice right now um, the amount of attention I have. From the from the beginning of this whole campfire, never once has anyone has all of the group been staring so intently. And this is a very important aspect of what I will talk about once I get done juggling fire. <clears throat> so <clears throat> I'd like you to remember three very important things before we begin. Nine, one, one. It's <laughs> a chocolate joke. Here we go. On the count of three, everyone together. One, two, three. Now, as I mentioned earlier, juggling torches in the dark is really hard because all I can see is fire. I can't see the handles. <clears throat> However, I can see your smiles. <laughs> And that's the best part about this, is that right now I have everyone's rapt attention. And you're listening to what I have to say, no matter what happens. <clears throat> Nobody's perfect. <laughs> we all make mistakes. And my job in the last five months has been putting out fires. Partially. It's a great art form. And what I love about art is that it can communicate. Now, with fire, we're communicating danger, intrigue, and acrobats. But with my mouth, I can say whatever I want during this time. Jack be nimble, Jack be quick, Jack better jump before he burns his pants. I'm not crazy. Come on, come on, come on. <laughs> thank you, thank you, thank you. It's been a long time since I've juggled torches. I haven't needed to because recently the art form that I've been using to communicate hasn't been juggling, but I've been using puppetry and magic. Um, I come from a background of evangelical Christianity. I'm not a religious man now, but it's good context for you to understand that uh, early on my very first job out of high school was teaching um, biblical message using puppets. And I went around the world. I went to 150 cities my very first year at age 19 in the United States. And then 150 cities again the next year, 200 churches a year, going around teaching teachers. They say if you can't do, teach, and if you can't teach, teach teachers. <clears throat> and so that's what I did. I had no other skills except for puppetry and juggling and communicating like I am now. What was great about that is that I got to tour the world and, and work with uh, different missionaries, many of them who were humanitarians. Um, there was a time when evangelicalism was one of the strongest humanitarian arms in the world 100 years ago. It's kind of changed. However, the skills that I learned were how to communicate um, sort of uh, metaphor using, or, uh, using magic, puppets, and illustrative things like juggling to hold someone's attention and give them a message that might, that might work. For instance, with magic, we have all kinds of principles of appearing, disappearing, multiplication, um, <clears throat> and uh, transformation, these are all great metaphor for teaching uh, concepts. Of course, within the church world, you can see where that kind of works. But what's uh, significant about this is that the, uh, the churches have a creative way of teaching where they sort of believe any means necessary to get across a message, whatever you can do. Even if it's something very, very small, if you're, if you're um, making a pie, you can write Jesus loves you on the pie with some, with some frosting, and when you give that away, someone experiences that joy. Uh, this sort of idea that they pass out tracts or pass out Bibles. If just one person comes to know the truth, well, it's worth it to me. Of course, the odds there are doing the numbers game was always strange to me. It's like, well, if one person comes forward, what about the 99 you turn away? Aren't you in the hole by now? Uh, <laughs> but the point is, is that they would use any means necessary to teach a concept. And so a very special thing happened to me when I was working at the puppet factory. I worked for the largest puppet manufacturer in the world, which is like saying the best ballerina in Beaumont. Who really cares, right? <laughs> but it was significant to me because I love puppets, you know. And so um, we were invited to go all over the world to teach different missionaries this particular technique, especially in storytelling cultures where it worked very well to use story and animated things to communicate a message. Well, I met a man over the telephone who said, I need some free stuff. And I said, well, I went through the wrap. I said, well, sir, all of our customers are nonprofits. Of course, we can't select one over another to give free things to. We can keep our prices low in order that everyone will have the same advantage when the work that they're doing. And he said, but let me tell you my story. And I said, well, okay. 
So he told me the story, and I said, let me talk, you've got to talk to my boss. And so I passed the phone over to my boss, and within a half hour, my boss came walking back into my office and said, you're going to Cambodia. Because he loved to give away things, but he hated to give away anything to anyone who wasn't going to use it properly. And so he was going to send thousands of dollars of puppets to this man, but not without the proper education. And I was the guy who taught, so I got to go to Cambodia. And when I went there, I found something amazing. There was a man working for the Southern Baptist who was a chemist for the University of Kentucky. He took his family and said, we're going to serve the Lord. Here are my Lord, send me. But when he got there, uh, he realized that proselytizing wasn't necessarily the strongest thing because really when people are dying from disease, the last thing, they, it's not top on their list to talk about spiritual things. Maslow's you know, uh, human needs suggest that spirituality isn't on the top five. And so he's noticed how dirty the water was, and his wife said, can you clean this stuff up? And he goes, well, yeah, actually, I can. Um, and so he began to develop all kinds of technology that the World Health Organization and UNICEF would adopt for purifying water. Things you've heard by now, uh, things like uh, uh, water filters that use uh, ceramics or uh, ultraviolet light, all these sort of inventions he was doing and implementing quite well. But he said, the problem is it doesn't matter if I clean the water because if I clean the water this way, they don't understand basic germ theory. They put the clean water in dirty buckets. The technology is useless without the education. And I go into the markets and I see them watching Barney the Dinosaur, another export from Dallas, and they're attentive, adults, small kids, everyone, doesn't matter what their um, age is, they're very, very attentive to this, and so I think we need puppets to teach this. Okay, and so I came over and we did, and we developed a program about waterborne illness and germ theory using basic magic tricks and using basic puppetry skills to illustrate concepts quickly, very, very quickly, not textbook learning, not learning from, from someone holding a flip chart and pointing to, you know, to a cup that looks dirty, but we could actually use a, a magic trick to illustrate this is clean, this is dirty because of this process in between, you wash your hands, do all these demonstrations, and not only did it work, it worked so well that he met the Prime Minister at a wa water health conference, and he saw that and said, I want this in all of my schools, and I was sort of the apprentice to this amazing man who was doing amazing humanitarian work using any creative means possible. At one point I visited him another time and he had eight parrots in eight different cages with eight different tape recorders um, playing things and he said, check it out, these parrots sell for like a hundred bucks to the white people in the market. So if I can teach all the people in the village how to do this, we can be rich, you know. He always had crazy ideas. He had so many ideas. I saw him with, uh, um, he was using Korean techniques to uh, have um, odorless pig farming. He was using recycling tech. He had goats up on stilts. They weren't wearing stilts, but they lived in a, in a, in a hut on stilts because foot disease was the biggest problem and he found a solution to that and he was always just using his scientific mind to say how can I meet basic human needs and that inspired me very much. I became very close friends with the man and his family and three years ago he died of a heart attack and I still have this skill and so uh, I met a comedian who said you know why don't we um, he, how can I shorten this Five months ago, I landed in Kenya by myself. The first time of all the countries I've been to, about 22, where I haven't been invited. I wasn't invited to go there. I just decided, let's see if this works. Because I believe that puppets are a communication device. It's actually one of the top five teaching tools in the world, except it's very rarely used because there's no education. There's no one teaching. Well, I've taught 20,000 people how to do puppets around the world, so I know how to do this. And puppets have the ability to say things that humans might not normally be able to say in public. So when you go into a culture where there is issues with sexuality or issues with um, a disease or, the, or human sanitation or politics or all these sort of things that people don't really want to talk about in public, well, they'll watch a puppet because it's so, well, it's not real, it's not a person. And so it can say whatever it wants to in public, but yet it's realistic, so everyone listens very carefully. And so it's a fantastic tool, but I didn't know if it would work there or not. Um, because you just don't know until you go to a place. I mean, I had my assumptions, that's why I went, and so I started working with different people and doing uh, different things uh, to try to learn the culture and see what they really wanted to learn when it came to teaching about HIV, uh, its spread, the stigmatization of children who are born with it, and the prevention of it. Topics that Kenyans or Africans don't really like to talk about. When a comedian friend of mine here in Dallas told me about this idea he had, he kept looking over his shoulder whenever he'd say the word condom because it was so uncomfortable for him to say in public. And I thought, wow, this is an amazing thing because puppets can no problem do that. Man, I showed up in Kenya, and within a week, I was on national television on their morning show. And the intern said, how did you get on here? Oh, you're, on, you're on Friday? And I was like, yeah, I'm on Friday. He said, we have politicians waiting for two months to pay to be on this show. 
how did you get on? I'm like, I'm a white guy with puppets. Who doesn't want to see that? <laughs> right? It's the craziest thing. It opens so many doors. I mean, in the, I, I, I've, I've, I've uh, had dinner with, with uh, um, one of the number one pastors in the country. It's like 1,500 churches. I've been to the, uh, the president's state house. I've been to... Um, I eventually lost all my money because it was just a passion project. I didn't want to use the nonprofit system to do my research. I have a charity now that backs me, and I'm the international director. But this first trip, I didn't want to waste anybody's money on on, on this and just uh, d- to discover um, what needed to happen on my own. And so uh, I did run out of money because of, of other weird things that happened in the U.S. while I was gone. So I had to get a job, and I worked with the Kenyans in a Kenyan way. I never saw white people at all. And I had experience. I became the first white stand-up comedian on television in East Africa. <laughs> I'm on the radio today on, on up half the stations doing ads in Swahili. Uh, poorly. But they wanted someone who spoke it poorly for the ad. <laughs> so I was just trying to make money. Like, i got to survive here. You know? It's so hard. It's, it's a psychedelic wonderland. It's the wild, wild west if it was run by middle management. You know, it's, uh, it's, a, very, it's a very complicated place. And I wanted to make sure that when I had the money, I would go in there knowing the things I need to know, not to make sure I don't waste a single dollar of anyone who would donate to my nonprofit. And I believe I've accomplished that goal. But uh, um, the exciting thing is for me is that as an artist, we oftentimes choose to entertain, which is fantastic. It was a huge rush. But other artists um, use their art form when they teach. They usually teach sort of political ideas or they teach ideas that sort of meet their uh, sort of uh, emotional need to get out but I found that art uh, the performance art or any kind of art can specifically be used to educate and it can be a very 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 strong tool because it's so unusual but how many times in your lives do you was there a time like in high school or middle school or even elementary school where a speaker came in only for an hour but he said a little nugget that stuck in your brain for 10 years. You might have forgotten that nugget by now, but you remember having that experience with some one guy just really inspired me, you know? Th- those, those moments are so powerful that I sort of tested this idea. Right about three weeks ago, I was in Karn. And Karn is the name of the town in Kenya that's named after the woman from out of Africa. And it's, so it's a very nice, posh place. There's a lot of nonprofits who run big, big businesses there. And, um, it was an orphanage for kids who had been abandoned because they had HIV. And I've learned something about myself, especially yesterday. Yesterday, what happened in Connecticut didn't affect me in any way, shape, or form. It just didn't bother me in any way. Um, similarly, when I was living in Pangani in Kenya just a month ago, um, Al Shabaab threw a grenade into a Sunday school classroom three blocks from where I had breakfast. And, um, many children died there, and I also had no reaction whatsoever. It just doesn't, uh, there was bombs going off, and, and, uh, and there was um, a lot of gunshots, and it was a dangerous area where I have been for the last two months. It was quite, quite dangerous to be there, and I wasn't allowed to walk, and a lot of the Somalis who lived there were afraid, and they locked themselves inside of their apartment buildings. It was a dangerous place to be, but it never bothered me emotionally, and even in the refugee camps I've worked at in the past, or different uh, the desperate places I've worked, it never really bothered me, but what does is when, I, when I, like on 9-11, when you saw the bodies coming down, the jumping out, you know, people were infected, and it d- didn't bother me. What gets me every time is watching a fireman run into the building. Or when I see, um, when I see someone helping those situations, I just, it just chokes me up. It's as if my empathy button was wired on the other side. I don't care. I'm suited to see awfulness. It doesn't bother my brain. What passionately drives me is watching solutions. It just chokes me up and makes me crazy inside. And the fact that I can use an art form to do that suggests that any of us, whatever skill we have, can be used to, to educate or to, to do something greater. But as I said, I was in Karen and I went to this orphanage with uh, kids with AIDS. And you know, I see these kids and they're just so sick and it just doesn't bug me. It just doesn't, but I'm okay, I can handle this, I can, do the, I can do the work. I'm not emotionally crippled by what I'm seeing. And then we did our show, and during the show, uh, it was an hour-long puppet show we put together with some juggling and some magic. And I watched these kids, and they were just alive with smiles. They were just beaming. And it, of course, that killed me. It was like, this is, this is, what, this is so hard to watch. They, they have this relief for like this one hour. And of course, our, our, what we're teaching was that each and every one of you are valuable, each and every one of you are special, and you're, and, and you're born the way you are, and you are the way you are for a purpose, and that you have value no matter who you are. 
and it's sort of a sort of the thing that's sort of passe in the U.S. We don't want to hear any more of this rah rah. I'm the best sort of uh, amplifying all the kids to be what they, in their heads than what they really are. There's a problem with that in the U.S.A., but not with kids in Kenya who are dying of AIDS. You know, this is something they need to hear for certain. And I went into the administrator's office afterwards. I said, let me just ask you a few questions. He goes, well, before you do, let me tell you. I've been teaching through an interpreter for the priest here for the last month and a half on this subject of, of, of their inherent value and, and how special these kids are and how um, you know, important they are to the world and that they matter to society. And today is the first day a child has ran into my office 20 minutes afterwards and told me all the things that you talked about. They remembered it in a different way today. Even though I've been doing this for a month and a half, your one hour presentation has, has done something in their minds where it, it's clicking, it's making sense. I was like, yes, finally, right before I'm leaving, I have confirmation that I'm on the right track and this really can work. And so that's my project. I, I've done all the, all the research and I've, I've done all the, all the things necessary to know the rights and wrongs and what has to be said and how it has to be recorded, all these sort of uh, things. But now I'm on to phase two here in the United States to do fundraising to do the project. Um, but I'd like to take this opportunity at this pop-up TEDx to remind people that Education is exciting if you make it exciting and can be so much more effective when it involves the arts. We're sort of ingrained in this idea that it has to be through a book or through a lecture. And evidence suggests that when it comes to extracurricular concepts, maybe not math or social studies, maybe, maybe not science quite as much, when it comes to other topics that people need to learn about, the performance arts, the visual arts, are not something that you need to think is being secondary, but can actually be a primary way. And for anyone here who feels like you have a purpose in the world, but you don't quite know where it fits, try jumping in with two feet to Kenya and see if it fits, <laughs> because it totally did for me. Now that's not real advice, but it is um, my personal thing. So I don't know exactly how to wrap it up, except to say thank you for the opportunity and to inspire everyone that um, Maybe you are wired for a very specific purpose, and I encourage you to use that purpose for, uh, for education and educating people who need it. The end. <laughs>